Hi, I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome back to Real Conversations, where it's my pleasure to have back Dr. Pippa, Dr. Pippa Malmgren, who is a famous author, a best-selling author of a book you will know called Signals. She's awesome on Twitter. She's very positive on the world right now. Uh, she's actually coming out with a new book, and I'll actually, uh, Dr. Pippa, maybe talk about what your what your new book's going to be about a little bit. Just give us a little bit of a teaser. Sure. Well, it's about leadership in the 21st century and how the skills that caused you to be successful in the 20th century are not going to work in the 21st. And it's about helping people who want to be leaders kind of orient themselves on the landscape. I find I'm dealing with a lot of people who are between 45 and 65, and their big complaint is, I'm trying to lead my organization, but nobody's following me. <laughs> and that has something to do with the fact that the organization can see that the guy doesn't actually know where he is on the landscape, that things have changed. And so the book is about how to orient yourself into this new reality that we're in now. Well, things have changed, and your uh, your backdrop right there. If you talk a little bit about that, your uh, the backdrop to this interview looks like it's changed a little bit. What, what's going on back there? Yeah, so I co-founded a robotics company. We make artificial intelligence-led aerial robotics or drones for commercial enterprises, and it's an amazing space to be in because um, it's I can't even begin to tell you changes that are coming in the way companies manage their assets as a result of being able to have not just an aerial view but access to comparative data over time in terms of cost savings logistics management i mean the list is just endless it's incredible so i'm, I'm psyched to be in this space oh that's awesome and you, you also have some you have some explicit thoughts on that how uh, artificial intelligence ai data using just you know, what you're re really building there, I mean, will affect the money management industry. What do, you, what do you think the biggest opportunity or biggest risk is for money managers that might ignore it? I think one of the things is that money managers are not being imaginative enough. And so they're not considering, the, for example, we're entering an entirely new dimension of reality. Now, I know that sounds a bit doolally, but imagine if every single thing can be virtualized into a data point. And you will be able to look at those data points about the world and have a more precise view of reality than you can have by looking at reality with your own eyes. It's almost like a holographic data sphere that is being created by every sensor, every camera, and the triangulation between them, which is artificial intelligence, connects the dots between all these things. So I'll give you a little example. You know, we're seeing this happen in China right now. They've introduced what they're calling a social credit system. So if you, let's say, borrow your mom's car and you drive with um, the handicapped parking, you pull into that parking space because you're just going to drop a little package off. It's no big deal. Yeah, now it clocks this whole thing. <laughs> and you have an Uber score assigned to you. And now your Uber score goes down and your eligibility for government jobs falls your um, mortgage rate maybe goes up. It literally is a triangulation on every single thing you do. And I don't think that people have really registered. I mean, there was one guy, amazing story, who literally burned his house down, right? He splashes the gasoline <laughs> all over. He burns his house down to get the insurance. But what he forgets is that he has a pacemaker with a chip and it's broadcasting his heart rate and his physical location 24 seven. So of course they see that he's not actually somewhere else as he claims, he's there. And I think this is the thing, people haven't registered that you are throwing off data constantly. And this data sphere internet knows more about you and your business than you know. Now, isn't that the most exciting thing? I mean, if you can quantify literally everything, I mean, we certainly try to quantify anything that we possibly can, but it's almost endemic, as you know, to the nature of the debate out there on world risks and economic realities that, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's endemic to the debate that people are qualitative. They're not quantitative. So how, how quickly do you think that we get there? I mean, I'll, I'll be quite thankful to a degree, but I, I'm a little nervous about it, uh, yeah, Pippa, because where you take advantage is where people haven't been able to quantify things, where you're quantifying things. So I wonder how, you know, what your time, you know, your time horizon is on this. Well, totally, and in fact, that's a big thrust of my book, is to say that this kind of binary, all you know, win-lose, right-wrong answers, uh, this idea that all of the answers are in the data, that's a very 20th century way of thinking about things. And what we need to do in the 21st century is also bring in some of the more qualitative 
assessments. Because you can be dead right about managing the PL of your company and suddenly have an accident with social media that drives you down the drain. And you're like, but that's exactly. not in any of my models. And you're like, yeah, but it's equally important. So yeah. getting people to think in a qualitative way, um, you know, and to think about things that we normally associate with. Well, not with the workplace. You know, I can say as a woman who's, you know, been working since I was in my 20s, I have wrote, written this book partly about the fact that as more women enter the workplace, different corporate values start to show up. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying women have a lock on things like, for example, empathy, because they don't. Men have that too. But there is definitely, you know, masculine way of thinking about things, and there's a more feminine way about thinking about things. Empathy might fall more on that feminine side. And the key is for really good leaders, they can use the whole keyboard of emotional thought process. They can do the highly quantitative, they can do the highly qualitative, and they fluidly move between these things as is appropriate. That is what will define leadership. I love that. I mean, empathy is one of my favorite words. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, again, if you can't, you, you can't get a grip or a perspective on, on what somebody's trying to tell you, you can't quite hear them at all. Uh, but on, back to this qualitative point, though, I mean, the world, I've found quite a tremendous amount of opportunity just seeing the world be, just use a, a very easy uh, qualitative view that people will have, which is their political one. Um, the political fear that people have had qualitatively uh, has been trounced, literally trounced, in, in particular in the U.S., by the economic data itself. And the better your data, the better you've been, uh, the closer you've been to qualitative opinion on ways uh, the, the world should go politically, the worse you've done. Totally. So actually, that's a great example. The data has been fantastic out of the United States and also out of the United Kingdom. You know, I've been involved here in the U.K. in advising the British government on uh, the Brexit negotiations. And the tone in the press here and the general tone in the business community has been a little bit like in the States where everybody's saying it's all a disaster, the debt's too high, the country's going to fall apart, you know, now the Brexit's going to happen, it's even worse. But in fact, all of the data is better. We're seeing record high employment, record low unemployment, the growth numbers are much better than expected. Uh, exports are better, I mean, just on almost every front. But what matters is not just the data, it also matters how do people feel. And I think that that sense of, but no, we still don't have the great time that we want to have, is a predominant fact that does influence politics and policy. So that's a very difficult issue for political leaders. What do you do when your numbers are great, but people keep saying, but I don't feel great? Yeah. Or vice versa. I see a lot of businesses, especially the more entrepreneurial, you know, like in my world, the tech world, people are like, yeah, I'm firing all engines, I got sales, it's good, my future is great. And all these politicians say, yeah, I'm just going to ignore them because what they're up to is it isn't influencing my world. So I think perspective really matters and how you look at the world and be able to see things through other people's eyes. Because it, sometimes it's just mind blowing how very different the world looks with the same data set. <laughs> it is amazing, isn't it? Or you can just ignore the data sets altogether. I mean, you, you know, one of the big debates maybe six to 12 months ago was that the soft data or how people felt was too strong and that the economic hard data wasn't, uh, wasn't in line with it. Now, of course, these two lines have converged in both the soft and the hard uh, are good. So, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, again, it, it seems to me that. Uh, one of the biggest opportunities might be just the polarization of the world in terms of their political stance or what, what mind you. What do, what do you think is a bigger opportunity or is it just all one gigantic opportunity when it comes to uh, the, the, the path forward? Is, is it that you're, you're, you're more objective, you're more empathetic, that you're not political, uh, or is being politically partisan a big opportunity? Like, I, I wonder, I don't know what the answer is, so I wonder if you thought that, that you might have it. Well, look, you know, again, it depends uh, what you're what you're doing. If you're an investor, then what only thing that really matters is the return on capital, and and are there places where you can get it. When I look out at the landscape, all I see is amazing amount of capital, insufficient good quality deals for that capital to go into. People everywhere are building, trying to create new things, like I'm doing with this robotics company partly because they realize that their employers are still downsizing or not upsizing, even though we have growth. So they're like, hmm, can't depend on the big companies. They see their governments have that massive debt problems. They're like, hmm, they might be able to not look after me in my retirement. I better create my own thing. 
And one of the symptoms of this or the signs is record number of people over the age of 55 re-entering the workforce, which mm -hmm. I think is a incredibly good thing, yeah. uh, especially yeah. since we've gotten vastly longer uh, lifespans now due to medical advancements. And all those people are going to bring all their skill sets with them. In fact, I think that's the fastest growing employment area, both in the U.S. and the U.K., and it's vastly underestimated. And it will change as well their, their spending patterns because, mm -hmm. you know, now you're like, oh, well, I'm earning some money and maybe from three or four different sources, right? Because you don't have one employer when you're 55 or older. Usually you have a couple different gigs that you're doing. Yeah. It's a different kind of gig economy. So as an investor, I look at that and I go, you know, it's hard to bet against it. We are literally in the midst of a major industrial revolution and everyone is able to participate, young to old. So like show me the downside. Now, if you are a worker, there's a lot of nervousness about the innovation. Right. And again, being in robotics, I know people are really having a heart attack saying, oh my God, I'm going to lose my job to automation, robotics. We're going to have, you know, unemployment. There's a lot of talk about the need for a universal basic income. I just wrote a piece I put up on LinkedIn uh, a day or two ago on converting the universal basic income into a universal basic incentive because what we know is that for almost 200 years we've had extraordinary automation and robotics introduced into the world economy and what's the end result of all that record high employment mm -hmm. like record high so this nervousness that robots are going to replace us i think is all wrong what they will do is augment us they will change the way we work and for sure change the nature of the work that we do. So really what people are afraid of is exactly what you said before. It's not so much the robotics, it's the fear of change. Yeah. And I think yeah. we can get human beings a lot more comfortable with change. In fact, change is a lot more exciting than, you know, go to college, get one job and stay there for 30 years. <laughs> I like the idea that we're going to get to do a lot of different things, that you're going to be changing in your lifetime. And I'll finish with one last thing that I just feel really strongly about. You know, some people say to me, yeah, but what about the poor Indian laborer or Pakistani laborer who's lifting heavy bags of rice and now some robotic tool is going to do that instead? And my view is excellent because how much human capital are we wasting that exists among that community of people that have never been educated, that could be educated, and frankly, who knows what kind of Steve Jobs or Einstein lurks amongst all those people. And if we put a little bit of effort into their learning process and upgrading their skill set, you know, it's much smarter to use that human intellectual capability for more interesting things than lifting bags of rice. Yes. So I'm not saying that it's an easy, smooth process, but it's absolutely doable. And never in history has it been so easy because education and skill sets can be reached so easily over the internet these days. Yeah, you can learn fast, that's, that's for sure. I mean, it's, it's, again, it's endemic though to certainly my profession, I mean, uh, and, and, and yours as well, you advise a lot of these people uh, that we obviously do business with, but when you talk about institutional investors, for example, a lot different than venture capital investors, uh, but again, if you just think about institutional investors, all they're going to want to talk about is the downside these days. They will talk about uh, what the greatest risks are. If I mention one PIPA, and I mention you know plenty because there are always risks, but there are, to your point, there are many opportunities, if not many more opportunities. People rarely want to discuss the upside. They they absolutely want to talk about that big boogeyman who's sitting around the corner somewhere. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I hear you. I'm, I hear it all the time as well. Well, I've been bullish on stocks now over the last almost five years, and I remain so for many reasons. One of them is that we have, what, 20 trillion more dollars in the world economy today than we had when the financial crisis happened. And we know that the central banks have not taken it back. Okay, they might raise interest rates a couple of times, maybe even, oh my God, four times this year. Yeah, it's like taking a cup of water out of the Atlantic Ocean. It's not a tightening. It's a fairly <laughs> normalization back to, you know, what would be reasonable levels. Anyway, all that money is sitting there. It's got to go somewhere. And when I talk to the biggest institutional investors in the world, they're saying, uh, I'm, I'm in stocks, but I'm not overweight because I was hesitant to buy at the top, right? It's a bad look to be buying stocks at all-time record highs. 
So every day I hope and I pray the stock market is going to fall 10%, but it never does. So I have to buy <laughs> like 2% pullbacks, right, which is also a bad look. They're in bonds, and then they have a big whack in cash. But the problem with bonds and cash is now inflation is back a little bit. Now, I'm not saying it's wild inflation or crazy, but a little bit of inflation is a huge issue for an investor. So everywhere in emerging markets, in the industrialized world, inflation is now basically burning at your rear end, and it's telling you you've got to get out of cash and into something hard. So that's either equities, real economy, or private equity, build a business, or finance the building of a business, and or, or hard assets like property. And so what I see is a world where actually that money has been heavily sitting on the sidelines, and now it's saying, oh my God, get me out of cash and into something real. All that makes asset prices go up, not down. Now, I could talk a little bit, too, about the geopolitical risks, and people love to cite that as, you know, World War III is about to break out. <laughs> yeah, I don't buy any of that either. And, you know, I'm a, a big focus on geopolitics. I'd take, if we have a minute, you know, North Korea is a great example. Everybody Definitely. was like, you know, nuclear meltdown, you know, disaster. What has actually happened is the North Koreans have just agreed to come to the negotiating table with China and the United States. We have China, the United States, Japan, and South Korea all in wide agreement that whatever needs to be done to sort this issue should be done. Um, personally, I think the deal that's in play is, and, and it's a little bit shocking, my, my idea, but I do think that the way Xi Jinping sees it is President Trump is our first president in modern history, maybe ever, frankly, who is literally willing to give away territory. He said to the Russians with Ukraine, you know, we're not really interested in that. America doesn't have a national security interest, so if you want Ukraine, you go ahead and have it. And the same thing with Syria, go ahead and have it. And so Xi Jinping's like, oh my God, he's giving stuff away. So, you know, could we say if we fix the North Korea problem, can we have North Korea, like soft annex the thing? And I think the president's view is, sure, because we don't want it. Like, it's a nightmare of a situation. If you think you can handle it, great. And the fact is, our military now is of the opinion that letting China have a kind of soft annex of North Korea brings no strategic security risk like it would have done in the old days. Technology has changed. So if they have that coastline, if they have that physical land territory, actually, if, the, if you're getting, giving that away in exchange, for removing nuclear Armageddon from the global agenda, that's maybe a small price to pay. And so as a result, you get good news on North Korea, and interestingly, the market doesn't really rally because everybody was so sure that it was all gonna go the other way. Hmm. Imagine yeah. that. Imagine consensus got another thing wrong from a geopolitical risk perspective. <laughs> I guess the, uh, the, the, the last thing I want to ask you on is Brexit. I mean, you're one of the few people who nailed it right out of the box, but uh, also one, uh, the, I'm sure everyone wants to hear your current thoughts on, on what's actually happening in the UK. So again, you know, now these are my personal views um, because I'm, I'm a, an independent advisor to the government, which means I give my opinion. They don't necessarily take it or follow it. <laughs> you get paid for it at least. <laughs> but here's, here's, I think, what, what's happening. Um, again, it's not a binary win-lose. It's not just that the UK wins, Europe loses, or vice versa. Both sides can win. Um, what is clear is that Britain is not likely to raise its regulatory red tape to be higher than EU levels. In fact, it's lowering its regulatory red tape. And it's gonna have a lower tax rate and the freedom to lower its tax rate if it wants to, compared to Europe. Now, in my view, money is like water and it will move to wherever it faces the least resistance. And so, in the meantime, where are the Europeans going? The idea in Europe is they want to have more centralization, more harmonization. That means higher tax rates, higher regulatory red tape, more government uh, involvement in the economy, more centralization. And so what investors are saying is, when I talk to them, the biggest investors in the world, the sovereign wealth funds, the pension funds, they're saying, you know, Pippa, I don't like the um, uncertainty that Brexit brings. 
But on the other hand, I still can't make any money in France, in Italy. We still have economies that are not functioning very well. They look likely to function less well as governments raise that regulatory burden. And so what we begin to see uh, is that the foreign direct investment in the UK actually has risen yeah. since Brexit announcement, which took almost everybody by surprise. But not me. I'm like, that. of course it's going to go up because <laughs> Britain is the freest economy in the region. Now, having said that, we have a Brexit movement now occurring on the continent. Now, it may not be that they're pushing for full exit from the EU, but the citizens of Europe are starting to say, hey, you know, whatever it is we're doing, it's not really working. We've got 40 percent okay. youth unemployment. And this is why we see the five star party in Italy beginning to win more than people expected. Why the AFD in Germany is winning more than expected. I think in France, the right is gathering momentum to have uh, more of a comeback. It's not that I think the hard right in Europe is winning ideologically. The issue is the same as in Britain. It's about centralization versus decentralization. And as the European Commission tightens the power and tries to centralize, the public is going to go the other way and say, mm, I'd like more power at my national level and less given away to Brussels. By the way, I think this is exactly the same issue that we have in the US. Um, and, you know, strangely, uh, Donald Trump represents a decentralization movement, uh, a, a weakening of the power in Washington and a strengthening of the power at the regional level. And that helps explain why his supporters have not really run away from him in spite of lots of other reasons they might have done. You know, he basically, you might not like his language and the way he expresses himself, but he still stands for freer movement for the business community and for entrepreneurs. So it's kind of the same issue. And by the way, China's got the same question. You know, Xi Jinping has just announced that there are no more elections. Yeah, he's basically in charge until he dies. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Putin's kind of the same. And both Russia and China are very much about centralizing power. And I suspect that that's inconsistent with innovation. It, it doesn't. Yeah play well for investors to have that. So I think in the end, you know, Brexit is, is in play. I think the British economy is not only going to be fine, I suspect it will be stronger after than it was before. The European Union has every chance of also emerging stronger than before if they choose to go down a path that's more friendly to innovation and to uh, business, which right now it doesn't look like they're going to do. Yeah, I love that theme, decentralization, free market capitalism. Imagine that. You don't need Donald Trump to teach you about that. Uh, but at the, at the end of the day, if, you had, if, you had a, if somebody said, look, Pippa, here's, here's a billion dollars. You have to put it to work in innovation in either the U.S. or Britain. What would you pick? You can only pick one. Oh, I, you know, it would it depend on the area. I mean, Britain's very strong in artificial intelligence, I have to say. Yeah. Really strong. And it's really strong in things like creative industries. Um, the U.S. It, the U.S. is definitely you can't ignore the U.S. The U.S. is also firing on all engines and doing really well. I thought you were going to ask me not for a geographical location, but for a sector. Yeah, sector and or I, company is the easier answer because you just picked a better management team and better idea. But I mean, the the country is a hard one. I, I wonder. I wonder who's got more upside versus. Uh, the prior centralized downside. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think those are both wonderful places to be. I just wonder uh, if there is a difference. You know, the fact that, again, everybody's like so sure that the British economy is literally going to slide into the North Sea and then just sink. <laughs> they need to watch right. the darkest hour. They'll be okay with uh, the thought that that may not happen. <laughs> It's like, I think it's a buy. I mean, the fifth largest economy in the world is not going to sink into the ocean. But, but it is amazing that you could even consider the UK uh, even, even in a dead heat with the US on that answer. I mean, you, you go back a year ago, and again, you weren't the the person that was, you know, parading around with bad punditry. But I mean, uh, people, you know, it's, a, it's an astonishing feat when you think of what happened in life year over year in the UK and where they are today, that you could even consider uh, the UK being at least as good an answer as the US in terms of free market capitalist dollars. I know, it's bad. well, and also remember, we still have a possibility that we end up with a labor leader in this country, oh. right? The 
they're showing labor's ahead. Yeah. So you know, we have to consider that possibility. And That's right. my view That's right. is if we do end up with that, the markets are going to choke. It's going to be ugly. We're definitely you know, going to see sterling fall, the stock market here fall. But here's the key thing. The moment that Jeremy Corbyn and his team start to actually nationalize, right? They actually take the British rail shares out of your bank account and don't compensate you. And we suddenly learn again what it is when a government takes your assets from you. You see, this is the thing that young people, they don't know because they don't have any memory of this. They don't understand how it works. So I think like uh, my impression when I talk to them is, oh yeah, well, of course they'll pay us for the British rail shares. And I'm like, well, no, that's not how nationalization works. They just take it and then you get nothing. And they go, oh, but that's shocking. About so what I think is if they actually start to do it, even the young people are going to say, wait a minute, that, that's not right. That's not protection of private property. That's not rule of law. So I suspect it wouldn't last very long if he even came into power. Yeah, socialism isn't exactly a sustainable trend in the UK or in the US for that matter these days, I don't think either. I will have to see about that. Anyway, I appreciate you. You've, you pretty much went around the world. I mean, you did, you did it again. You do it every time. You can hit on every part of the world with a very thoughtful and differentiated opinion that just so happens to be accurate a lot of the time, too. So thanks for that. We, we appreciate the conversation. I do my best. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. She's Dr. PM. You can find her on Twitter. She's awesome, like I said before, on Twitter. Uh, and I'm not awesome. I'm just, I'm there. There's my Twitter handle, too. Thanks for joining us.